Hello and welcome to a new reaction video. My name is Larissa and today I am going to react to another Band of Brothers thing. As you all know, I just reacted to the Band of Brothers series. Then I took a small Christmas break, which was really nice. And I actually still wanted to have the Christmas break right now, but I know myself and I just can't stop doing YouTube. So this week I was like, I'm just gonna start again. And the thing is, I actually uploaded the last Band of Brothers episode on my Patreon. And then a lot of people commented like, you should really react to the We Stand Alone Together uh, documentary from Band of Brothers, because uh, it's like it's about the real people and the real events. It's like the full interviews with the soldiers. So I thought that was really interesting because I really like the end of Band of Brothers. It was so interesting when they finally showed the names and all. And I was actually kind of sad that we didn't see more of that and I had no idea this was out there um, and then like so many people said I should watch it and I was like let's just react to it but yeah with all of that said I am just going to watch it I didn't want to wait too long with it um, and it's only been like two weeks since I finished Band of Brothers so I think it's still kind of fresh in my mind and I am very excited to see this to get maybe even more information behind this and see like the real people talk more. Before I start, I wanna tell you though that you can see my full reaction to this, so the full hour and 17 minutes on my Patreon. It's under the Uncut Reactions tier, so uh, make sure to check that out. If you're interested, the link is in the description. And now I am really going to watch this. All I remember is a tremendous blast in a flash. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground in the snow and I tried to get up. Only thing I could see were the broken ends of my legs. And I thought my legs were gone. In my back, trying to raise my legs up. And I thought, I'm dead. And then the next thing I thought of was my mother. What's she gonna say? Because I was an only <coughs> child. Aww. I mean, if you see the amount of people that lost their legs, I get why you think that. Or even think you die. Oh, this is really giving me chills. It's like totally bringing me back to the show. I don't know why I'm almost crying, but like, it's so real now. We saw their story already, but now these are real images, real people talking. C. Carwood Lipton. I was born in Huntington, West Virginia. Concord, Massachusetts was my hometown. I was born in a town named Insulin, Washington, J.B. Stokes. I was born close to Bonham, Texas, in a rural area called Glenner. Born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. My nickname was Babe. <laughs> and my mother, she was a little Irish, brother, red hair, fiery, with a time with tough. Mom had 10 children. I love how they so all talk about their mother. It's so survive. cute. We lived on a farm at the time. It was was poor. Everybody was poor. I was married when I was uh, 19 years 19. old. 19? 1941. On December 7th of 41, the USA is in a war with Japan. And everything just went silent. I said, hell, I don't want to go in the army. I said, go uh, you don't have to go sooner or later. Something was wrong with you if you weren't in the service in those days. It was just what you had to do. Difficult physical requirements, and I just got interested. Nobody forced you to do this. You volunteered. And it was the notion you wanted to be with the best. But once you got in there, you was proud to be. Get that. We because in the be show, proud. I was at first like, why would you and, choose uh, to go in the most difficult difficult unit, you know. That. We were working with. But then one time they said, I want to be with the best because then I have the biggest chance of survival. And I was like, whoa, that, that is pretty smart actually. I never thought about it like that. The training I got and the men I trained with gave me the confidence to, uh, to go into bed. And a lot of this training was to build you up physically and mentally. Some of them lost as much as 40 pounds. But I didn't have nothing to lose. I weighed about 130. If I would lost 40 pounds, I wouldn't have been big enough to stay. I had to climb this mountain 
called Curry every every morning, running up. Oh and yeah, we saw this in the show as well, well, right? You, know, you could see him lay on the side of the road, you know, going up and coming back, you know, where they're sick. And it didn't matter how hard they trained you and how tired you got, you would still go out on your own and run the mountain at night. Which I remember when I was watching the first episode and I really didn't understand why it had to be that tough. And, and now I'm like, yeah, this makes sense, I guess. Now, we learned how to be soldiers at Tacoma. I guess it just really makes it tough mind. indeed. I you need that. It was as well trained as you could get a soldier to be at that time. You're asking yourself, what the hell am I doing here? I came down and stand up and hook up and we did it. Coming down. It was a thrill. Everybody just seemed to enjoy it, so they were not I, I feel like it would be kind of fun, but I don't know. I don't think if I, that I would ever jump out of an airplane. You know, coming down was great too, and I did hurt myself when I hit the ground. Some of the big ones hit the ground like a tunnel. <laughs> Worried about most of your shoot, did you pack it right? I don't like to think about it. <laughs> All kinds of ideas of what you might have done wrong, or I worked out fine. When you walk up that gangplank, you know you're gone. You pass the uh, Statue of Liberty. It's so well, funny because we've seen gone. all of this. It's so crazy, but I love it. They put us in a, in a camp, preparing us for D-Day. No, nothing. You couldn't get out of the camp. They had guards around the marshaling area. We did not know which day. We did not know where we were going to jump. We knew exactly where we were going. Knew exactly what to do. Where the planes were lined up and all the gliders hooked up to the planes, got the orders to get in the planes. This is it. We were, we were confident and, uh, and calm. I gotta say, now that I see them like telling it all and kind of seeing the real footage, I feel like it feels less depressing than the show or something but i think it's just because of the way they tell it and i don't know they just look back at it as this time in their youth and this like, brotherhood you know but of course the war hasn't really started here yet or like they're not there yet so everybody got in there and a lot of them were very scared here we go my feeling was for my brother who was killed at that time. Oh, didn't we also at, see that um, in alone. the show? I swear I was going to kill every damn German I came across. And that's why I think they nicknamed me Wild Dog because I did a lot of killing D-Day. It's everything from LCIs to battleships down there in the channel. And I think that's when I first realized how large the invasion was, uh, tremendously large. Absolutely horrendous. It was like a July the 4th celebration, 10 times over. No matter where we were, out. They went out of the plane, they would get shot up. Yeah. And they told us that all you'll have to do is shove up to the door, throw that leg out, prompt blast will hit it, and you're sure. gone. They were right. Only I was gone out and my leg was in. And I was hanging upside down looking at everything down with my leg in the plane and everything. You know, all that's happened in just a split second. During that, I guess, uh, I had to get out. We, we just wanted to get out so bad. And that fence had, I'll never will forget it, it had glass on the top of it and cut me up and everything. But, uh, that didn't bother me. I was down and I got down with my gun. Yeah, I mean, that's I what matters. And we were running into Germans everywhere. We had to hide. You know, because if, if we didn't, we were dead meat. Yep. And I come down that tree like a monkey. And then there I was with a French knife and a canteen and about six candy bars in my pocket, ready to fight the uh, German army, you know. So there's. I just love the way they're telling it. Like some of them are telling it like it's like. Nothing but a jump knife. Not like land. how depressing it really was. They were just so like, oh yeah, and this happened to me. And like these sense. small funny things, uh -huh. you know. I love that. E Company was... But 
They weren't aware oh, it's of what we had. And realized we only had 12 people through the farm area. To, uh, it's so nice when I recognize Lieutenant names. Winters. Winters was a, an exceptional leader. He was able to size up all through the war, decide quickly and correctly. He gave instructions on uh, Compton, Malarkey, and when to crawl up there and hand grenade that machine gun crawl through the grass. I get out to this hedgerow and I peek, I look up and I peek through the bushes and I see a couple of Germans over here about broken this gun. So I pull out a hand grenade and I pull a pin on and I throw it as high and as far as I can throw it. Had enough hang time on it that about the time it got to them it went off in the air and, and I got one of them. Then I jumped up with the grenades you know, with a stick come out of there, and, and, and it, and I thought he's going to miss me. And that thing fell right down in that trench with me. And I was trying to scuttle my way out of the way of it, and it went off. And I felt like it blowed my butt over my head. And pretty near did. He's Didn't we already or also see that? I think so, yeah. But honestly, the amount of people we saw being shot in the butt, or like a grenade, or whatever. I yeah, it happened a lot of times. When you think of a guy who was that dedicated to his company, to his buddies, that he apologizes for getting hit. But that's the kind of guy he was. And that's the kind each one of them was. They were all the same. Each man with great respect. Respect I can't describe. Each one of them proved himself that he could do the job. If I had done a little bit better job, there would have been a couple more men going home. Aww. I never thought I'd get through D-Day, let alone the next phase or the next phase. Oh, we've seen that in the show, I think. That's the parachute. We got that done in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, 1944. Me and Johnny Martin. Trump is a skunk. We'll go here and get a tattoo. We were the replacements. There were young kids that came in. They were like heroes to us, you know. That's how we look at them. Back in the Netherlands. People are losing, continually losing helmets and equipment. And all this equipment's raining down. And if you got hit with this, you're going to be killed or wounded before you get off the drop zone. We moved out towards uh, the Wilhelmina Canal. Our mission was first to uh, take a bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal. I was maybe 150 yards away. It, it blew up in our faces. What a way to die in combat, to be killed with that flying timber. It took us till the next morning to get across. The Dutch, it was just marvelous. Their, their reaction, they, uh, they loved Americans and still do. For, uh, coming in there and pushing the Germans out. Now we're getting actual footage from the Netherlands. They call us angels from the sky, which we were. I mean, you, you were on the German occupation for four years, right? And you see paratroopers come out of the sky on Sunday morning. Who are they? They're the angels. <laughs> they love you. Their welcome was unbelievable. How happy they were to see you. The people were out there swarming all over us trying to congratulate us for being there and all that. We didn't mind at all. And they were really proud to see us to the point where it was dangerous for us. Snipers did some damage in a situation like that. <laughs> We had a lot of fighting in that area because we're sitting right on the Rhine River and Germans right across the river, you know. They're fighting like heck to keep us out of Germany. I think I threw the eight grenades in about four seconds and then I took off. The doctor that counted the holes in me down at Nijmegen, yeah, Nijmegen, said it was 32. That was our first experience with artillery in large numbers. I saw a huge mushroom cloud from the shell, and Joe Joyce stepped out. 
And I run up. I remember that like it was just I run up and I grab him. And he said, Oh, don't touch me. I'm hit all over. He said, I'm, I'm bad. I said, Okay. I said, I'm gonna go see Jim. Bad as he was hurting, Joe Toy. He said, I already checked and he's gone. Jim Cannell might be alive today. If he hadn't said to me, you stay here with your gun. I'm going up. Never, never forgot that. You got to remember what one guy did because he thought it was his job to do, and he took a shot for you. The exhaustion on these men, the physical exhaustion, absolutely miserable for 70 days straight. You're only going to be off the line for a few days and you're going to be facing Baston. Yeah, <laughs> because like, I don't know, I think it would just be so heavy, mostly like physically, especially this if it's like 70 full days desperate. without a break. Absolutely. And then you get a few days off and then you have to go to Baston. Baston? I don't know how to pronounce that, but yeah, we saw how bad that was. I was waiting to get there.